are definitely coming around the home stretch now. So I have one lecture left that I'm going to give you that's going to be sort of a summary of a lot of the concepts that we've gone through so far. And then I'm going to go over the assignments and go over the midterm and the things you'll need to do before the next class weekend. And maybe we might even get out early. So we'll see what happens here. No guarantees, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to talk real fast and we're going to get out. Because it's a gorgeous day outside and it's Sunday. So Anyway, uh, we will definitely conclude today, however. And we're way ahead of schedule, so this is really good. So the last lecture is number 6 eight. It's on the relational model. It's going to put some of these pieces together for you. I know that you've been hit with a lot of information, especially if you're brand new to these concepts. And I know that the, some of the exercises that you've done, the six exercises that you've done, have been a little, some of them have been a little time consuming. Some of them have been new information. Some of them is like, I've just met Oracle. What, about, what do I know about Oracle kind of thing? The thing with the exercises is that if you turn them in, and they're, they're your own work, you will get full credit for it, especially if you turn it in by Tuesday. I was just reading a message, however, that said that the IITU website is going to move over. It was sent out to staff. Apparently tomorrow the IT website's going to be down. I suspect the EMS is going to be down as well. So don't freak out if the website doesn't, if the internet doesn't come back up and within a reasonable amount of time, I will extend that deadline for you. If you have problems submitting the work between now and Tuesday evening, send me an email message, and I will probably end up, you know, taking a look to see what's going on because they're moving the server from one hosted environment to another hosted environment. So I have, you know, you know how that stuff works. It never works perfectly. So if there is problems, I will extend the deadline. Don't worry about that. If you turn something in, you're going to probably get full credit for it as long as it's your own work. And most of you have shown me the work, and it's great, and you're going to get full credit for it. So don't stress about the in-class assignments. They're meant for an attempt to get some hands-on. Some people are going to grasp it. Some people aren't going to grasp it. You have all different levels. So it's... It's just um, an exercise for you to kind of go through in terms of a thinking exercise. And it's a lot of reading and it's a lot of absorption of a lot of material over the last three days. So I don't expect everyone to understand everything, especially if you don't even have Oracle installed. It's probably going to be a challenge right there. So what I'm trying to tell you is don't worry about it. As long as you are here, as long as you turn something in, you're going to meet all the requirements. You're probably going to do quite well. And if you do have a problem trying to upload something, do send me an email message. That way I know that there's a problem. And expect between 1 and 5 a.m. is supposed to be when they're taking it down, which it would be tonight, actually, you know, actually before Monday morning. I expect the whole thing to be down on Monday, so don't freak out when it's down on Monday. <laughs> because nothing ever goes as planned. It will always be down, so... All right, so I want to conclude with this lecture number 6A, which is on the relational model. And at that end, I will go over the midterm and the three assignments that are going to be due between now and November 1st. And then we'll talk about the next weekend that's coming up. Um, and so uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully this will be a smooth ending. Uh, so in terms of this lecture, this is a review of all the things we looked at. Uh, actually highlighting certain things just to reinforce some points. So the logical database model takes a look at the logical view of the data as we've seen. And the relational model is basic concepts of entity attributes and relationships and the relationships among these entities as we've seen. And we also looked at how the entities and the attributes are organized into tables. And this is the purpose of the dependency diagram, the purpose of the entity relationship diagrams is to show you how the pieces uh, in terms of the design fit together. We also looked at, and we will look at again in terms of the conclusion of this weekend, about the relational database operators, the data dictionary, the system catalog, how data redundancy is handled with the relational database model, and then why indexing is important in terms of a concept. So yes, we do actually have redundancy. It's, it's called controlled redundancy. Because if you think about the concept, if we separate all the data out and put them into different tables, we have redundant keys because we have a primary key in one table that's a foreign key in another table that's a foreign key in yet another table. That's a lot of redundant data 
actually. Um, which, you know, it's, it's put in there on purpose. It's called control redundancy. What we don't want is uncontrolled redundancy, where we have the customer's first name, last name, and address in every single table. So that's really uncontrollable because we can't update it, we can't modify it. So we implement redundancy to give us more control over the data in terms of the concept. The logical view of the data is, is what we've been talking about in terms of the relational model. Enables us to view the data, data logically rather than physically. We're not looking at the data, we're looking at the data about the data. It reminds us of the similar file concept for storage, but it's more of a logical approach and a hierarchical approach. The table itself that has the advantages of the structural and data independence, and then it resembles the file concept from a point of view. It's very similar because we have tables that are sort of like files, but they're not really files, they're just sort of concepts associated with it. So the relational model has to do with relations. The other word for relation is table. The tables themselves have their own characteristics associated with them. So a table is a two-dimensional structure, as we've seen with rows and columns. And yes, this is a review, so we're just kind of reinforcing some points. So this stuff should look very familiar to you at this point. It uh, contains groups of related entities, which is an entity set. And then we have occurrences of entities or instances of entities, which are the rows that appear in the table. And then we have the term entity set and table that are often used interchangeably. So an entity set and a table are synonymous for the most part. Entity occurrences are occurrences of different entities. Can we keep it down? Otherwise, I'm going to have to keep yelling louder. <laughs> Thank you. So tables themselves are also another word for relation. Because the relational model, we have the creator. We follow a COD format. In fact, if you go into Visio, if you go into SmartDraw, you'll see COD, C-O-D-D, -D, as a form, COD form, which is actually going to be a, a tool set form, who is a, one of the researchers who actually came up with this model. Um, so a lot of his work attributed to the current tool sets and the current diagramming technique that we're using. So uh, COD is used as the term relation as a synonymous for table. So think of the table as a persistent relation. The relation itself has contents so is permanently saved for future use, which is why we're creating a database for the most part. So we know we have characteristics in this lecture. It's number 6A, by the way, if you want. It's a nice little overview and in, in replacement for a textbook to give you the vocabulary of some of the things that we've seen this weekend. Uh, characteristics of the relational table in terms of the relational table. <clears throat> we can go through and we can look at each one of these. I'm not going to go through it. But we can see that where we have a tuple for a row, we have a, a table call and represents attributes. And we can kind of see where the words are fitting together. Rows and columns or intersections representing single data values, characteristics for attribute domains as an example. So there's a lot of little words that are used to describe all of these small little components. Once you get familiar with them, then you start using them as if they were part of uh, you know, they're database terminology, but they're really part of the under overall understanding of the concepts. So here we have a figure that looks like a student table. As an example, we have these student table attribute values. And so when we consider the table, we have the table name. We're calling this one students. And in the student name, we have attributes that are columns. And in terms of the columns, we can set acronyms for and these are abbreviated names. So oftentimes, you're not going to put the full name of the actual attribute out there. You're going to put abbreviations. So it doesn't really matter what you call them. It's totally up to you. If you keep the naming convention the same, you can use them in multiple tables, and then you actually remember what it is you're looking at in terms of the data. So going back to the concept of controlled redundancy, it makes the relational database work. So without controlled redundancy, the data is not going to be relatable. And the relatable is the keys. And what is redundant is the information stored in the keys. So you want to minimize the amount of keys that you're using to maximize its functionality and, the redundancy, and minimize the redundancy. Because every time you put a key in a table, you're making it so that you have to put that key in another table because you have a foreign key and a primary key. The more times you duplicate the keys in all of the different tables, the more data you're storing. And the more data you're storing, the more redundant sometimes that data can become, actually. And so that controlled redundancy is great when used in moderation. You don't want to repeat the same data in every single table, however, especially when you don't need it, when it's unnecessary. 
So tables within the database share common attributes as well that enable us to link tables together and those common attributes are going to be the, what we're calling the links. And so multiple occurrences of values in a table are not redundant when they are required to make the relationship work. So in theory, keys are not redundant data. They are just multiple pieces of data that we are essentially having to include so that we can link everything back together after we pull it apart. So redundancy is unnecessary duplication of data by definition. So here's an example of a single relational database with some redundancy. And what we have is the vendor code. The vendor code is in this table and then the vendor code is in this table over here. And we're using a link to link them together. So it's an example of a simple relational kind of concept using controlled redundancy. What's going to happen on the final exam and on, on the midterm exam, see now it's quiet, <laughs> is that <laughs> I'll just mention an exam. <laughs> it's, okay, I don't know. I, was just, I used it as a trick. No, I'm just kidding. What's going to happen is you're going to be asked questions like, how do you reduce controlled redundancy in a database table? Minimize the number of keys that you're using. What is controlled redundancy in a database table? It's the linking. It's the, purpose data. it's the purposeful data that we're putting into multiple tables so that we can link them together to create the relations between the tables. So as a kind of a concept, that's some of the stuff that you sort of want to get out of this particular lecture, sort of the vocabulary in terms of what you're using. You know, how does an attribute relate to a column in a database table? It is a column in a database table. <laughs> well, what's an attribute? Well, it defines, describes the entity. Well, what's an entity? And an entity is a table. It's a relation. Well, what's a relation? A relation is a table. So there's many different words for the different components in the pieces. So knowing the big picture in terms of the database concepts is kind of like what you want to sort of get out of uh, this weekend, actually, as well. The relational schema, what is a relational schema, as an example in this particular case? Well, it's the relational schema, as we've seen over and over again, it's the tables, the views, the indexes, the data dictionary, the control files, the log files, all of the different pieces that come together and are usually housed inside of the database object. So you're like, well, what's the database object? Well, not every database calls databases objects. Only Oracle does. Other databases don't necessarily have an object concept. Oracle happens to think it's object relational, which it sort of is, actually, because you can stick all the stuff inside of objects. And then if you're doing that, then you can create a hierarchy of objects and reuse it through inheritance and through object instances, and then you can create multiple instances of objects and house them on different servers. So there's a lot of functionality to the merging of the relational concepts with object-oriented concepts as a key as well. That's the purpose of that last, well, the first assignment from today that talked about object orientation in terms of relational databases. Uh, but here we have, these are screenshots actually from Microsoft Access, and if you're, if you're curious about this, if you bring up access, in fact, old versions of Oracle used to do this, but I don't think we can do it anymore. I haven't found the feature in 11G, but in Microsoft Access, you can still do this. If you create all the tables and you put all the links in and you have the foreign and you have the primary keys and you configure everything, there's a little button that says show entity relationship diagram. You show the entity relationship diagram, you get something like this. It's working backwards. So there's tools out there that you can use, actually, to take your Oracle database and create entity relationship diagrams off of that. And the tool will come back and say, oops, sorry, can't create it. Usually means there's something wrong with your design. If the tool fails, it comes back with errors, or it shows you something and there are no links between any of the tables. It's generally a red flag that there's something wrong with your table structure. But that's the backwards way of doing it. So what we've done this weekend is we've taken the concept of the database, we've put it into dependencies and we've put it into entities and relationships and attributes and created entity relationship diagrams from this, taking the diagram and then translating it into the table scheme and then taking this table scheme is nothing more than going over, opening up the application and typing in the, we want this table, we want this table. The problem is people don't do it that way, they go backwards. They open up the application, they start typing stuff in. Oh, because I want to do the application. Okay. And it's like when you write a research paper, if you just open up Microsoft Word and stare at a blank page for a couple hours, your research paper is not going to be that good. <laughs> if you don't open up the computer at all, you take out a pen and a piece of paper and you start writing your research paper, thinking up all of the ideas and stuff that you want to put in your research paper. Then you open up Microsoft Word and you put all those ideas from the paper into the computer. 
that usually works out a little bit better. So the funny thing is, is most database tools work backwards. After you've put all this stuff in, what you're supposed to do is verify the design against your paper. But half the people don't have the paper. It's because they haven't done the design. They just went over and threw some darts and said, oh, I want this table. Oh, I want that table. I want this table. And then they make a diagram out of it. It looks something like this here, or something very similar, I should say. And then uh, probably with more components. And then they go, oh, I guess that's a good design. Or the tool tells them, hey, that's a really bad design. Or the tool, the tool doesn't show anything like a one-to-many relationship or anything. And, and then you're looking at this, and you're still lost because you still don't know what to do at that point. So the entity relationship diagram and the entity schemes are nothing more than verifying your design if you use it. So some tool sets have it, some don't. There's a, there's a couple of third-party tools that will work backwards from Oracle and from MySQL and actually create diagrams for you. Also, Microsoft Access does it, as you've seen in the screenshot here. So we also talked about the concept of keys this weekend. And so we have foreign keys and primary keys. And on the slide, you see we have a secondary key. And I said earlier, so we don't have any such thing as a secondary key. Well, Microsoft Access has secondary keys. <laughs> Oracle doesn't have secondary keys. Most people in the real world don't have anything such as secondary keys. But secondary keys doesn't mean anything. So the database manufacturer is kind of like, you know, they make up their own rules. Because this is not a standard practice. So we can have anything we want, really. We can have monkey keys and banana keys and stuff. And we can put that into the model. Are we truly object-oriented? Or excuse me, are we truly relational? Well, it's the same question with object-oriented as well. But anyway, long story short, it's a concept that people have used throughout time. It doesn't necessarily apply to good database design. So the foreign key, we know, is the attributes whose values match primary keys somewhere. And these values are in the related tables. We know that we have referential integrity, where we have a foreign key that contains a value that refers to an existing valid row in another table. That gives us the example of referential integrity. So on a midterm exam or a final exam, if I were to ask you, what is referential integrity? You'd be able to say, well, it means that there's an ability to link data up using keys, and that one reference in one table can be linked by the database engine with another reference in another key. And we can designate these keys as primary and foreign, and we can create an organization to um, make sure that there's an existence in one table, there's also a corresponding existence in another table. And we don't have data that's unrelated or inconsistent, which is why we have referential integrity. So secondary key can be used strictly for data retrieval purposes. In Oracle, those secondary keys are unique keys, because we only have primary keys. <laughs> so anything that's going to be a secondary is going to be a unique key in terms of its definition. So here's some examples and some definitions for you. And we have key types over here on the left-hand side with some definitions on the right-hand side. Most people went candidate key. What's a candidate key? And then they discovered, well, candidate key. Here's a definition of that. Well, now we have another couple things in here. We have super key. Super key. Well, there's a such thing as a super key as well. In Oracle, we don't really talk about candidate keys, although the word candidate key comes up a lot. So a candidate key is a minimal super key. Well, what's a super key? A super key is an attribute or a combination of attributes that uniquely identifies each entity in a table. So nobody uses a super key anymore either. Candidate keys are a bunch of super keys, but a super key doesn't necessarily have to contain a set of attributes in itself to be a super key. It could be a combination of attributes. And then we know we have the primary key. We're pretty good with that already. Secondary key, we know it's going to be a unique key or combination key. And then the foreign key, which is a key that's not used in the original table. It's in a, used in a table that's outside of where it originally started in. And uh, you know, we don't normally put unique key out here. Unique instead is a characteristic that we add to a column in a database table. We don't necessarily create, and it's not known as a key. It's just an attribute. And unique is sort of like null and not null. It's kind of a property that we can put on the attribute. And then we have integrity rules, as we've seen so far. And the integrity rules are put in into the form of constraints and checks that we've seen in terms of the SQL lecture. And so for entity integrity, we have the requirement, the purpose, and then a little example to show you what we're talking about. For an entity, all the primary entries are supposed to be unique, 
and no part of the primary entries or the keys themselves are supposed to be null, which means we're supposed to have a value. The purpose is to guarantee that e each entity existence is unique and identifiable. And an example of that would be no invoice can have a duplicate number or can be null. So in short, all invoices are uniquely identified by their invoice number. Well, that would mean no two students would have the same student ID or no two classes would have the same class number, which would be a nice integrity rule to keep track of the data. In terms of referential integrity, which is different than entity integrity, entity integrity is focused upon the uniqueness of each entity instance. Referential integrity is focused on the ability to bring the data together after we've separated it all out into different tables. So as a requirement, a foreign key may have either a null entry, may have either a null entry as long as it is not paired with a table with a primary key, or the entry must match a primary key <coughs> in order for it to be valid. So every non-null primary key, foreign key must, must have referenced an existing primary key value. So we put the rules in for the primary and for the foreign key matchup, which gives us our reference or referential integrity. The purpose, it makes it possible for attributes not in the corresponding values, uh, not to have corresponding values, but it will be impossible to have an invalid entry if that were the case. And it makes it so that the data can be brought together. When we join tables, we join them normally on the keys. So we take a primary key and a foreign key and we join them together. <clears throat> and when we join them together, then we have the separated data put together and there's a corresponding match for each entry in both tables so we get all of the data. If we don't get all of the data, our queries and our examples and everything that we're doing is going to be totally invalid. So especially if the foreign key is null or something and then we don't have a matching primary for it. As an example, a customer might not yet have been assigned a sales representative number but it will be impossible to have a valid sales representative number if they haven't been assigned one. So we have to put the referential integrity rules into the database scheme in order to make sure that the database table actually gets created successfully and is used um, consistently throughout the application. So here's an illustration of integrity rules <coughs> where we have a database a table for customers on the top and we have agent on the bottom and we have a customer code or customer number over here and an agent code or an agent number over here and then here we have a problem here we have this guy here that doesn't have an agent number associated with him so that would be a problem because these guys here we have 501, 502, and 503 and we have 501, 502, 503 but this guy's missing so we have an illustration of what would happen if we didn't have any integrity rules going on. We can't link them up, which means that guy's probably going to fall off the charts when we run a report on anything. So We also can put in a dummy variable value used as a flag that can, might be like unknown or none or something of that nature. In fact, a lot of people use social security numbers with zeros in it, zero, 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 all, but then that's a kind of a red flag. And we can put that in as a default value as we've seen. That will make it so that it brings up something that <coughs> when the integrity rules are enforced. So in terms of the relational database operators, we know that we can they are all based upon uh, relational algebra. If you get the book that I recommended for the course, it's all about relational algebra. It's every single thing in there is about relational algebra, which not necessarily is good. But it's not bad, especially if you're a math person and you really like the whole see how everything is implemented from a, from a math perspective. However, from a usability perspective, what ends up happening is you'll learn the tools that you need and the queries that you'll run to produce the results that you need. And it's more application or it's more user friendly in terms of, or use, it's more usability in terms of the vocabulary of the database terms and rules like union and intercept than it is for the underlying implementation. Uh, so in terms of the relational algebra, can we keep it down? Yeah? The example you showed for integer rules, before, this one. So here the value is missing, so here it should allow the values to be inserted or not? If, okay, so if we can keep it down, or just take the conversations outside, that would be good. <laughs> I just can't yell over you. Okay.
because if they haven't noticed, my voice gets louder and louder and louder and louder because I'm trying to drown you out, but that's kind of tiring. So please just take it outside if you want. Okay, so the question was asked, and the question was, what was your question? I didn't even hear your question. Yeah, like, <laughs> if we have a missing value, yeah. uh, here the agent code is not there, right? Gotcha. So, uh, yeah, so we should not allow the record to be inserted in the table. Correct. So if we had, this is a lack of integrity rule. So if we actually had integrity rules enforced, this agent code would be a foreign key, and this agent code over here would be a primary key. And this entry would not have been possible. It would not have made it in here. This row would not exist because we would have gotten an error that would have required us to enter in an agent code. So this is an example of what would happen if we don't enforce integrity rules. We've got a, we've got a row here. In fact, we've got some missing data in here because uh, we don't even have it set to null here either uh, that would cause inconsistencies in queries. If I queried right now and I say, well, give me everyone give me all the clients or customers that are associated with uh, agent 501 this one might be a 501 but we wouldn't know it I would be one short actually I'm going to be one short for 501, 502 or 503 depending upon which one it fell into so this is an example of what not to do actually and it's a lack of integrity rules if we put the integrity rule in there and the integrity rule by definition is just make them keys designate this as a foreign key, designate this as a primary key, automatically fixes the problem because that row would not exist. So it's in, impossible to insert that row and not get an error message. So this is just a, these rules are just a way, different way of showing the keys, that's it, right? Just to... Well, not only showing the keys, but making sure the data is linkable and findable. It's without a technical concept. Yeah, yeah, without integrity rules. It's a technical concept, but it's also implemented in terms of the implementation of this table when we create the SQL query for this table if we just left out all of the rules associated with integrity we would end up with a situation if we said that this particular attribute is a primary key and this one is a foreign key and this one references that one then we have put the integrity rule into the design of the tables so that when the tables are being used we can enforce it so it's both a concept, but also an implementation technique as well. So it's a, the concept is, is integrity rules. The implementation is make this a foreign key, make that a, make that a primary key, <laughs> make it or make it a reference, or turn an index on, turn an index off, or do this or do that. It's in terms of the design and the implementation as well. Good question. <coughs> So in terms of the relational algebra, what we're looking at is defining a theoretical way of manipulating the tables and the contents using operators. And here's an example of the ones we left with. The select, the projection. I'm not going to go through a, a review of what I just did earlier today. But instead, I'm going to highlight a few things that we haven't looked at yet, where the differences between the difference of union, difference, product, divide. Some languages actually support what's called the divide. Some of them support a product. Give me the product of these two tables. Or give me the difference of these two tables, um, or join and intercept. And this is where we get the add-ons to the SQL language and also the features that exist with the database. So we can use relational algebra operators for existing tables and relations to produce new relations. That's actually what we're doing is we're producing a new relation. So you do a query on a relation, you get a relation. We call the query a query. <laughs> we call the relation a table. We call the output or the new relation, we usually call it a result set. We change the names of everything so that we can make it clear what it is we're referring to. If I said, I'm going to look at the result set, it means I'm going to look at the product of the query that's really a relation that came out of the executed query that I ran on that table. It's not the table. It's a new table. But it's not really a table. It's a relation. And it's really, if you refer to it as a result set, it clarifies what it is that you're exactly talking about. Some people actually call it results instead of result set. Java calls it a result set. And most programming languages refer to it as a result set. It's really a relation if you think about it. So the union combines all of the rows in two tables excluding duplicate rows. Tables have the same attributes and characteristics associated with them. The intercept must uh, yields only the rows that appear in both tables. So it's the intercept is where they're equal, and we get rid of the differences between the two tables. So here's an example of this put together for you. 
we have this table union this table gives us this table so the union is going to be we have microwave and we have dishwasher microwave we have dishwasher and then we have all this stuff over here so if we were to find the dates in fact this is a I answered this question several times for several people on the last SQL assignment where we had un well we didn't have union and we had internet sales and then we have customer sales or store sales and the question asked you give me a list or return a list of the dates of all where there has been a sales transaction that's clearly a union because you have one table of internet sales and you have one table of store sales and we want to know give me the stores give me the dates well it's this one plus this one but it's the intercept where there's a date for something so we can see that and then we can look at it as an illustration here that said, and you, there's multiple ways of doing that, by the way. If you didn't use it with the union, don't worry about it. <laughs> you didn't have to join, but you could have run two subqueries and taken the results and put them together and found all the unique dates. You could have found all the unique dates. You could have found all of the dates and duplicates. Or you could have done, uh, you ran a distinct on it before you unioned it. Or you could have done it uh, with a query and a subquery and gotten both of them together without using a union. Um, so essentially or you could have done an aggregate on both and put it together <laughs> so you could have done it in many different ways but that was one of the ways you probably could have accomplished the test but the idea is knowing that you can do it that way is kind of an interesting part um, so here we have table A and table B and we put it together and we get the union so the union itself is a combination excluding any duplicate rows by nature because we're looking at a set when we do this so all rows of the two tables excluding any duplicates which makes it an easy example. We also have the intercept, where we take one table and we intersect it with another and we find the difference. So we have Jane and George here. We have the yields Jane and George because we got Jane, we got Elaine, we got George. Well, we got Jane, Jane and George are the ones that are the same in the intercept, actually. So, and the intercept is defined here. It yields only the rows that appear in both tables. So we have both Jane and George appear in both tables. The rest of them are done away with because they don't intercept. They're not in both tables. So usually if we have students in one table and we have registrations in another table, we can intercept the two tables to find only the students that are taking classes right now, which is a nice way of kind of getting rid of all of the other students who are inactive or not taking classes, as an example. So we also have this concept of difference and product that we didn't see SQL for, but it's a concept that's implemented with the tools that are given to you for the SQL language. So the difference yields all the rows in one table not found in the other table. That is, it subtracts one table from another table. And so you can find the difference between one table and another table to see what's missing, essentially, is what you're doing. And you're doing that to find out, well, which customers haven't purchased anything. If we have a purchase table and we have a customer table and we have the customer information in the purchase table or we have a link to the customers, we can link it for the difference and we can go, well, these people haven't bought anything. And then we can know the difference, which is a nice way of doing it. Or we also have the product. So the product yields all possible pairs of rows from the two tables. It's, cross -join, it's a cross-join. It was a product. Is this table times this table, <laughs> essentially, which is why they call it a product, also known as the Carcinian product, which is just the multiplication of the two tables together. So it yields all pairs of rows from both tables. So here's the difference where we have table A and table B, and we yield the difference who's uh, not in table, who's in table A but not in table B. So we can kind of see the difference. And we could take the product, and we see the product is one table times another table. So if I asked you if we had 50 rows in table A, and we have 50 rows in table B, and we produce a product, how many rows are we going to have? <laughs> it's table A, 50 times 50. <laughs> what did you say? 2,500. Yeah, 2,500. <laughs> Yes, that's correct. <laughs> table A times table B. So. And you actually, how many times I've asked that, actually, and I get all these weird answers. <laughs> it's like, well, it depends on how you're going to join it. You know, okay, so like there's a spot where you just put a number. And then, oh, it depends on how you join it. If you join A to B or B to A, I'm like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> or it depends. Or they do and they plus it together. Oh, it's this plus this. No, actually not really, you know. <laughs> so.
this product is it's useless, useless. Like, mm-hmm. how to use it. like it, it is going to create a lot of redundancy but it is good in bed it's good in bed it's great for reports as she has mentioned yes because if you have let's say for example invoices and you cross it with descriptions associated with the products that are on those invoices, you're not going to keep all of the descriptions, the price, the order, all that information, you're not going to keep it in the invoice table. So you add them together, you, excuse me, you multiply them together, then you have access to all of that information to print out in the report. So it can be like item number one, hammer. And then from the descriptions table, you can say, well, the hammer is this, this, and this, and this. <laughs> And you have the descriptions for every single one of those products that might be on the invoice. So it's a quick and easy way for reporting to include everything. So you have the matches for everything. So we can place some conditions on that, like when the, uh, like we must have some hammer ID, like product ID. Here. Oh, it doesn't matter. It just puts them all together, corresponding. It'll, it'll just take everything from this one and everything from this one and combine it together. As if it were just all stored in one table which is what you get actually. But if you take a look at this as an example here, we have the product and here's some product codes here. So I see one, two, three, four, five, six, and I see one, two, three, four, five, six, and I see one, two, three, four, five, six, and I think one, one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> I, see, I see this repeated. You're going you're gonna to get non-normalized, or you're going to denormalize the data when you're doing this because you have repeating groups. And then I see Description, flashlight, 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 because this is coming from over here, and this is going to be the store information. We have store number 23, 24, 25, with aisle and shelves information. So we have a lot of repeated data, but it's filling in. For each one of these guys, it's filling in this stuff over here, and it's giving you all the different combinations. This is a product of both of them together. So it's going to give you a lot more information than you possibly need, but for reporting purposes, it's great because then you have the information that you need. And if you've ever looked at reports, they're kind of, depending upon the person making the report, it's kind of redundant a little bit, you know. It's like you see the same description, you see the same product number, you see the same product. And it's like repeating groups over and over again. And you have like five, six different pages of this stuff, and you're looking at it. And it's not consolidated because this is the raw data. People want to see the data. They want to see every single one of the sales. They want to see every single one of the products and what the product is and what floor it was on and who sold it. So you got Jane selling all this stuff here and you got Larry selling all that. And you can sort the report by salesperson or by, you take the repeating groups and you sort it by the repeating groups when you print the report out. So you, it makes the data a little bit easier to see. In uh, Excel, they call it drilling down. When you look at the in fact, the product is giving you a drill. So it's higher level abstraction shows you the aggregate. And then in, in Excel, when you drill down, you click and you it opens it up and shows you more data. You click and if, you, if you're working with that kind of concept. And the product is going to show you all of it to the lowest level of detail for the most part. Okay, so we have the select that we've seen already. And the select is pretty clear by now. It yields the values for all of the rows found in the table can be used to either um, to all the row values or can be yield only those row values that match a particular condition and the where clause as we've seen yields a horizontal subset of the table and then we have the project which yields all of the values of a selected attribute yields a vertical subset of the table so a projection is really just give me everything that matches something or give me everything give me all the first names give me all the last names so most of the queries that we're doing are a projection and then we're drilling it down into lower levels of detail because we're getting subgroups of the projection that we're looking at. So select all, will yield all. Select only the price, yields uh, less than $2, we'll give that. Select a product code that equals this, we'll, we'll yield that. So in terms of the, uh, you know, when you're selecting something and you're using the where clause, you're essentially drilling it down in concept. And so here's our uh, project price yields, project description. Most databases will use select in terms of the terminology and not project, but it's really a projection that you're doing with the selection and concept. So the joins. So we saw the joins in terms of the SQL stuff allows us to combine information from two or more tables. Basically takes all the data that we've spread out and puts it all back together. Real power behind relational databases allows you to use independent tables linked by common attributes, commonly described attributes. So 
here we have two tables that will be used in the joint illustration. We have table number one is going to be customers, and then table number two is going to be agent. So we've got these two tables, and we're going to apply. I'm going to apply, and I'm going to show you examples of all of the different joins, or most of the different joins that you might run into. The natural join. So we saw this in the. Uh, this is a little bit more to complement or supplement what we saw in the SQL lecture. And I'm not showing the syntax for the SQL because it varies depending upon the database you're using. And it's not going to be consistent among all. Because the syntax is supporting, some languages support different syntax. So here we have the links that are going to be, in terms of the links that tables will be selecting only rows with common values and their common attributes. So the results of the three-stage process. So we have a product of the table that's created. We have a select that is performed on step one, which is the product. And then the output yields only the rows for which the agent code values are going to be equal if we do an equality join on a natural join. And then we have the common columns that are called join columns. So the projection is performed in step number two. And the results of the yield a single copy of the, each one of the attributes whereby eliminating the duplicate columns. So if I took this table here, customer, and I joined it, natural join with agent, I get this one, which is the natural join in step one of product, where I've taken all the rows here and I've joined it with the other one. So I've got the agent information over here, agent code, and agent phone number, agent code and agent phone number from this table, and they're being added into this table. we got Walker, Andreas, this is just a sub-portion of it. Here's our Walker, Andreas, or it was just, don't worry about the length of this, it's the same. This is just the first screenshot is a shorter version of the same table. It's taking this first table and joining this other table to it where the agent codes are matching. In fact, you can see they have the agent code over here. So we have the customer agent code and then we have the agent agent code that we're putting together. On the natural join, in terms of the select, if we start out with this information, when we do a select on a customer code, we do the projection on the customer code, and then we end up with the final, uh, I don't have the final in here, but anyway, long story short, it's doing a projection on the uh, completed join between the two tables. So the natural join, the final outcome of the table that does not include unmatched pairs. So if we don't have, on a natural join, if we don't have any unmatched pairs, it doesn't show up. So we'd have to pad it or do a left or a right join in order to get the unmatched pairs. It provides only copies of matches. So if no match is made between the two rows, the new table does not include the unmatched row. This leaves out information, which is why joins are kind of important to consider in terms of all the different varieties. Because we may end up with situations where we get the wrong number of rows that come out of it. So... The column on which we've made the join, that is the agent code, occurs only once in the new table. If the same agent code were to occur several times in the agent table, a customer would be listed for that each for each one of the matches that actually occurs. So it doesn't actually filter any of the matches. So we have some other joins, and these are other forms of the join. So the equal joins which is the equality join or the theta join, and this is essentially the information I gave you already. It's in terms. the same as natural join. It is. Yeah, it's on the equal. Huh? An equals join is the same as an, a natural if you're looking at the equals condition. We can also use a, we can actually use a natural join with a less than or greater than. Yeah. But we're, what we're looking at, though, is the operator of it being equality, so it's an equal. So it's just more terminology for the same thing. So the equals join uh, is going to take us uh, to the concept of linking the tables together based on upon equality in terms of the condition compares the specific columns for each one of the tables. Outcome does not eliminate duplicate columns. It gives us the duplicates. And the condition or the criteria for the join must be explicitly defined, meaning it, this one has to be equal to this one. Agent code has to be equal or something. And it takes its name from the equality comparison or the equals operator. The theta join is any comparison operators used outside of the equals. So we have the natural, which is just the concept actually of joining them together without determining the unmatched pairs. The equal join is using the equal operator. The theta join is using anything outside of just the equals. So just to clarify that definition I gave you. So.
natural doesn't consider any un, unmatched items either. So um, outer join. So let's talk about outer join, and then we can look at here's the left outer join and the right outer join as an example. So in an outer join, which we haven't seen yet, matches pairs that are retained and any unmatched pairs in the other table are left out. So the outer join joins the table's customer and agent. Two scenarios are possible. We can go left outer join or right outer join. So outer does not retain the unmatches, just the matching ones get retained. So left outer yields all rows in the customer table. If we start with a customer and join agent to it, including those that do not have matches values in the agent table. And then the uh, right outer join does the opposite. It yields all the rows in the agent table, including those that do not have matches in the customer table. So as I was mentioning before, it depends on which table we start with, A or B. It's called an outer when we take one of the tables and we match the other one to it. And then we get from the original table, we get all the unmatches. So it depends on which table we start with in terms of what outer results we're going to get in terms of the unmatches. What we're really concerned with is retaining the unmatched information. So here we've done a left outer join. So we have the customer table and we, we're missing that agent code. So we have that blank agent code over here. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six rows that turned out of this table. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six rows, but we're missing the agent. So we, here we actually have more information, but we've only we've done customer to agent. This one here is agent to customer. So we started with the agent. So we don't have agent information for this guy on the bottom. So we're missing all of the agent information, but we have the matching customer for it, which is kind of weird, actually. Well, we have the matching customer. We just don't have the agent. <laughs> so it's a blank agent. So we can use a divide. A divide requires that we use one single column table and one two column table. We can divide a table. So we've got a table, we run a query to divide it. This is great to reduce the search space. So we have a table with two columns. The divide, the code out yields us the location. <laughs> So we take and we divide the column, the attributes out. We've made the table smaller because we're not interested in all of the other information. We want to keep the other information. However, our query is only going to be on the relevant information that we're interested in. So we perform a divide. And it takes and splits the table out. For our query results show us just the columns that we're interested in looking at. So we have this concept of the data dictionary and the system catalog. We've seen this vocabulary used in a couple of the exercises that we've had for this class. And just to reiterate some points and recap some information here from what you may have found or may, may not have discovered so far, that the data dictionary is used to define or provide the details for the accounting for all of the tables found in, within the user and the designer created database which means we have different levels of data dictionaries. We have system dictionaries with system tables. We also have user level dictionaries with user tables. So we can take and keep track of and what's in the data dictionary. Well, it contains everything, but also contains at least the attribute names, the characteristics for each one of the tables in the system. So it has the database schema in there. So if we had customer and agent in there, we would know in the dictionary what these things were. It's basically consider it a lookup table where the system can keep track of its own internal data. You may reuse names for attributes in every single one of your tables. That's not a problem because the data dictionary keeps track of it. So it's going to organize what's located where and what the hierarchy is, actually. So it contains at least the attribute names, characteristics of each one of the tables. It contains metadata about the data. Metadata would be the data type. Um, the length, all that sort of information. Contains a description as the database designer's database because it records the database decisions about the tables and their structures, keeps track of keys, views, indexes, features that are turned on and off, and all sorts of different miscellaneous information that's associated with the, uh, with the tables themselves. So here's a sample of the data dictionary. And so we have in here the two tables that we were just looking at, one of them is going to be customer, the other one is going to be agent. We have the attribute names that are inside of customer, attribute names inside of agent. The contents, 
what it what some descriptions, the data types, the format, the ranges, whether or not we have keys and what the primary keys are in this table. So all the data about the tables is stored in the data dictionary. The system account has the data dictionary for the particular system tables. User accounts can store locally the data dictionary. It's easier for lookup and it's easier for accountability. But the system administration and the system account also has a copy of that data dictionary as well. So there's a little bit of redundancy and that's actually something you can usually turn on and off depending upon how much security and how much control you want over it. Uh, but if you separate it out by user, it's harder to get to it per user. If the system has and keeps the master data dictionary files, then it's easier to access for the system, but harder for each one of the users because users would have to actually go get the information that they were querying. If you think about it, though, it's the system and the admin who's actually using the data dictionary for the most part. Users are just creating tables and using the tables. They may not necessarily be concerned with the dictionary components of it. The system administrator might, you know, probably is going to be using it a little bit more often. So we also have the concept of the system catalog. <clears throat> Most of you guys looked at log files and catalog <laughs> files and maybe dictionary information. Who knows what you found? And uh, what do we have with the system catalog? It contains the metadata. So we have detailed system data dictionary that describes the objects that are inside of the database. The term system catalog and data dictionary are often used interchangeably. So sometimes it's referred to as a catalog or system catalog. Usually we have system catalog files. We also have the concept of control files. All of these files are storing the configuration data that's going to be used by the system administrator normally to control access to the database, who's got what in the database, who owns what, where the stuff's located, what's inside of it, what's in, what kind of tables do we have, all of this stuff here as well. You know, what's the format of each one of the tables and stuff. Why? Because for backup and recovery purposes, if we have a track of all this in the system catalog, we can rebuild it. <laughs> we don't have to rely upon backups. We can actually rebuild it from the system administration accounts um, if we have it kept correctly. So it helps with the backup and the recovery techniques. Can be queried just like any user designer created table as well. We can query it. We can see how many tables and how many views has this user been creating? And what kind of usage, what kind of space requirements do they need? And stuff like that. So it gives us a lot of information that we can use. So the concept of data redundancy revisited. That, again, that's another example, a system catalog, system dictionary. Again, we got a lot of redundant data if we think about it. So data redundancy leads to data anomalies as well. So we might have a change, and that's why if the system catalogs and the system dictionaries aren't kept up to date, and we have utilities that we can run to sync them, if we don't, we might have anomalies in that. If we keep data that's redundant inside of the tables, we might also have anomalies with that, which is what the slide's going to refer to. So such anomalies can destroy database effectiveness, make it so that the database is not giving us the results. It's kind of like garbage in, garbage out. Um, if we put garbage into the database and we go query it, we're going to get garbage out of the database. We don't even know what we're going to do with it. So. so we have foreign keys to kind of help us reduce the amount of redundancy. Controls data redundancy by using common attributes shared by the table. Crucial for exercising data redundancy control, sometimes data redundancy is necessary. If we reduce the data redundancy, if we create third normal form tables, and I'll talk about normal forms the next weekend session that we meet. If we reduce that and we make it into fourth normal form, fifth normal form, we're making the data harder to access, harder to update. If we reduce it down to second normal form, we introduce data redundancy makes the database easier to use, easier to query, because it's putting in duplicates. It's putting in redundant data because we haven't separated it out. So let's say each one of the customers has all of the agent information right there, right next to it. What makes it easier to get at, easier to use, but it degrades the quality of the database because it makes it less efficient because we're introducing redundancy. But the, when we take the redundancy out, then we increase how much we have to query because we've got to go find everything. It's not all together. So the higher we get up in the normal forms, the harder the database is to use, the harder it is to query, which is why a lot of people have settled on third normal form. It's a nice balance. 
it's enough consistency, enough reduced redundancy, enough control to where it's usable. Any higher, unusable. Any lower, inefficient. So it's, it's kind of interesting how that kind of sort of works. Um, here's a small invoicing system as an example. And in the invoicing system, we have a customer table. We have a cust invoice table, a line table, a product table. And uh, we can use a relational schema here in terms of our entity relationship diagram to make uh, an invoicing system where we have a customer code that's a customer code over here. We have a line inventory number that lines up with an inventory number over here, a line number that has a product code. And this is essentially going to break out all the data, make it less redundant, more consistent, more tables. So there's more linking between the tables versus only having one or two tables. And lo and behold, we have the concept of indexes. And I talked about indexes this weekend. So indexes is an arrangement used to logically access rows in a table. We don't normally see the indexes. We turn the indexes on, we turn them off. The database uses the indexes. So we have an index key. So the index is the reference point. It points to the data located and identified by the key. And as I mentioned or earlier, Oracle uh, indexes everything by primary key. Some systems will also index on unique key. Because if it's a unique key, if you create a separate index for it, it makes the searching faster because you can use it for searching, for querying. So a unique index is an index in which the index key can only have one point or one row associated with it. You may create extra indexes all on the same table. You don't have to use the one index that's on the primary key. It depends on how you're searching the tables and how you're joining the tables as to what kind of indexes and how many indexes you may choose to use. So each index is associated with only one table, however. Here's a component of an index. And so we have a pointer or paint, painter. Painter number is an index key. And then we have a pointer to a painter table over here. The index itself is kind of like using pointers in C, C or C++, actually. It's like a pointer address. And then you go to the address, and you find what's there, and you pull the value out. But the database is doing it for you. So it's the equivalent of using pointers for a database than instead of just variables for a database, which comes in handy. Because we use pointers for efficiency in databases. So, All right, so here's our summary for this week, or weekend, I should say. Don't leave yet. I'm going to go over the assignments. <laughs> We're not quite done yet, but we are coming down the home stretch. Don't worry, I promised I'll have us out by five, and I will keep my promise. Entities are basic building blocks of the relational database, which is why we're using entity relationship diagrams. Entity set is a grouping. If we can keep the noise down for five or ten more minutes, we'll be out of here. Okay, good. Entity sets is a grouping of related entities stored in a table. The keys are defined by functional dependencies. We have the super key, the Kennedy key, primary key, foreign key all sorts of different keys. Primary keys themselves are unique values, identifying unique attributes. Keep that in mind. Can link tables by using controlled redundancy, which is where that concept comes in. Relational database classified according to the degree in which they support relational algebra functions. So some relational databases aren't quite as relational as other relational databases. It depends on how well they're supporting that relational algebra, which makes Oracle very relational. Microsoft Access, not so relational. Because <laughs> you can totally violate all of the relational algebra characteristics and totally not use anything. And then they introduce other features that don't follow through with relational algebra. So, Relationships between the entities are represented by entity relationship models. And data retrieval speed can be increased dynamically by using indexes. All right, so I'm going to end this video and start with a review of what you need to do to conclude this course. So let me stop this one here.